So think about that. If, if Michael Bloomberg can sit on the floor with all of his employees, maybe we can as well. If Sam Walton, who built Walmart, never had a private office, maybe you can get rid of yours as well. And you'll be blown away by what happens in this space. So I want to show you a video of a CEO, and I want you to look and see what you see. And he's a CEO who's a baby boomer. And I want you to look and see and ask yourself if maybe you could change, maybe you could adopt, maybe you could move into this future. This is a CEO walking into his office this past July, being greeted by all of his employees. spaces that are out in the open where people can work and collaborate. Bright lighting. About 30 to 40 percent of the meeting space is actually meeting rooms, but no private offices in the entire company. He's not wearing a tie. He looks great. Sometimes the dress code in these places can go a little bit too far. I think he's got the balance, except for one guy that you'll see in a second. You'll notice the meeting rooms have no blinds on them, just glass walls. There's dress code gone sideways. Everyone has 42-inch high workstations. Everyone has the same monitor. Everyone has the same chair. No private offices, including for the CEO. This is why he's connected to his people. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm a bit overwhelmed, um, but uh, how about getting back to work? <laughs> so 25 years ago, 25 years ago, the business book that we all read was by Tom Peters called In Search of Excellence, and it talked about MBWA, management by walking around. You don't have to walk around when you're actually plugged in and sitting with everybody. There's nowhere to walk. You're there with them anyway. And then you're completely connected. And that's when all of a sudden you really start to see what's happening in the organization and they start to see who you are. And that's when all of a sudden the connection really happens and that's where your employees start to go through brick walls for you. But then it comes down to communication. By the way, before I dive into the last module and we do some questions, this order form is a way for you to get my four speaking videos for you and your employees to watch and learn from. So I'm not gonna explain this for very long, but the one that we're doing today is around building a world-class culture. I have another one related to growth, a third related to landing free PR for your company, and the fourth is around the emotional roller coaster. It's essentially why we're all bipolar and how to leverage those stages. So for Vistage members, instead of the set of four normally being 988 or 847, I do it for you today for 700, but I need you to fill this out and hand it to me afterwards at the book signing later. But it's a great way for your employees to learn this content instead of you trying to explain what you've just heard today. So the last area related to culture is around communication. This is a photo from a company's website. We all have this same page on our website. What page of this company's website did I get this photo from? What was that? Yeah, your bios page, right? This is the leadership team photo from the VP of engineering. And her bio starts like this. Hi, my name is Leanne. I love shoes. I really, 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 like all caps italic underlined, love shoes. I have shoes for tango, I have shoes for dancing, I have shoes for date night, I have shoes for hiking in the Himalayas. In fact, the only reason why I even do this job as VP of engineering is because it gives me the money to be able to buy more shoes to do all the things that are on my bucket list. If you'd like a copy of it, click here. I love shoes. Oh, and by the way, I have my undergrad in science from Stanford and my PhD in engineering from Princeton. And after you've read Elaine's bio, you know what you do? You read Don's bio. 
and then you read Kelly's bio, and then you read Mark's bio, and by the end of about two hours, you're still reading people's bios because you've been sucked into their world because they actually have decided how to communicate to the outside world to get our attention. If you think back to your company's leadership team page and you can't remember the bios as being engaging for your own company, maybe you should give this a shot. If you have photos up there that are stiff and boring, you're pushing people away. This is engaging. This is community. The point of this page is to communicate. So communicate in the people the way that they want to be communicated to, not in what you think is important. You would never walk up to somebody at a cocktail party and go, hi, I've got my university degree in science. We're like, really? Ooh, who are you? Why would you do that? Hi, I'm a stiff guy. Like, ugh. But, but that's what we do. Look for these kinds of meeting opportunities to have face-to-face -face engagement and have these team meetings. Don't look at meetings as being a waste of time. Run them more productively. Run them in half the time you first think about booking them for, but be engaging and have the face-to-face -face time with your employees. I read a book years ago called The Dream Manager by a guy named Matthew Kelly. He talks about a woman named Mary from Cincinnati who is a Vistage member. Mary's company, in the true story called The Dream Manager, her company is a janitorial business. She cleans toilets. She had 400% employee turnover in this big company. So you'd hire like a couple hundred people and like they're all quitting, right? She couldn't keep people. And she tried paying more and doing everything and she couldn't get the employee turnover to really get below 200%. So she decided to sit down with her employees and ask them what she needed to do to stop the employee turnover. And what they said was, if you really cared about us as humans, if you cared about our dreams, our insecurities, our passions, our joys, if you knew what our bucket list was and helped us make those happen, we'd go through brick walls for you. So Mary put in place this program called the 101 Dream Goals. And basically, in the first week an employee joins her, she has them spend 20 minutes writing their bucket list, a list of all the things they want to do before they die, places they want to go, things they want to learn, anything. She would help them build all these things out. She then hired a full-time person whose job was to be a dream manager, and the dream manager's job was to help the employees one-on-one, -on -one, in groups, whatever, to get stuff crossed off their bucket list. And they didn't attach any of this to the company. They just attached it to truly caring about the human that was working with you. The dream manager's job was to help people get stuff done on their bucket list. I had a guy who worked for me, Jeff Coyle, who on his 101 dream goals, he wanted to sit behind the Vancouver Canucks bench and watch the pregame skate and watch the Canucks game play. So I just called Mike Johnson, one of the assistant coaches. He and I had been trading ideas on growing companies. I was helping the Canucks on culture and he was helping us build a sports culture inside of 1-800-GOT-JUNK. And I asked him if he could have Jeff Coyle come out to the game. He's like, for sure. So he said, how's Thursday? I said, great. So Jeff goes down to the game a couple hours before, watches the pregame skate. At the end of the second period, one of the players' wives hands him an envelope. Jeff opens the envelope and reads the letter, and it says, at the end of the game, come down to gate number six, and we have a surprise for you. So he's all excited. He thinks he's going to get like a, the signed jersey and a stick from the game. And he goes down to gate number six at the end of the game. And he phones me the following morning at about 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning, and he's hammered. <laughs> hey, Cammy, baby, what's up, buddy? I'm like, who is this? It's Captain. And then I think he passed out. Two o'clock that afternoon, Jeff came into work. And I'm like, what happened to you? You look horrible. He's like, dude, at the end of the game, I went down to gate number six, and there was a stretch limo outside. And they told me to get into the car. And when I got into the car, there were five of the Canucks sitting waiting for me. And we went to each of their bars that night. And it was me and five players. And I was their guest of honor. He goes, dude, I will go through brick walls for you for last night. I had to fire Jeff about three years later for stuff unrelated, he's used me as a reference twice in the last seven years. Jeff would still go through brick walls for me because I cared more about him as a human than I did about the company. And I could give you dozens and dozens and dozens of these stories. This whole idea of this dream program is really powerful. You have to be curious though. You have to really care about your employees' passions. You have to really care about them as people. And to know their dog's name or their birthday that's like saying, I'm going to have a coffee shop and play jazz. All coffee shops play jazz. Like, I know their dog's name. Really? Like, do you know their fears? Do you know their insecure? Do you know that they don't, haven't, haven't talked to their dad for seven years and they're dying to? Do you know that they're, like, terrified of getting on stage or they're worried about, about getting out of debt? Like, do you know who they are? 
When you care about that, that's when your company grows. And that's the difference between awesome organizations and just business. I'm going to show you a video of a guy, John Ratliff, the one who I started coaching from the three million to help himself with 107. When I told John this story, this same presentation that you got today, I taught it at MIT's Entrepreneurial Master's Program, and John saw this back in 2009. John created a Dream On program. He decided to take something and run with it, and I'll show you a little bit about how his program looked. Hi, I'm John Ratliff. I'm the CEO of Apple Tree Answers. I'm Emily Ratliff, and I'm the Director of Employee Experiences at Apple Tree. Essentially, what we do is we have live people, we answer the phone for companies when they can't be there to answer for themselves. Our frontline employees are the heart of our business. We were looking for ways that we could really, really drive the employee experience. And somebody said, well, what if we took the Make-A-Wish charity model and we kind of provided that model for our employees. As we narrowed down our list and narrowed down our list, that one just kept remaining at the top and turned into the concept we have now of our Dream On program. Actually, the first time I, I heard about the Dream On program was uh, when Emily, who's in charge of the program, sent an email blast out to uh, every employee saying, another dream has been granted. Uh, and that led me to think, well, what is this Dream On program? The company will actually give back to their employees but giving them a dream you know uh, giving them their dream I thought it was amazing <laughs> I never heard of something like that at first I thought yeah right <laughs> but I submitted a, a fairly simple dream I wanted my daughter to have a uh, birthday party an extravagant birthday party after my wife uh, unfortunately lost her job we weren't able to provide that for my daughter so I had submitted a dream my dream was to go on the honeymoon that I can never afford and the honeymoon that I always dreamed of. She was four at the time. I wanted to do something special for her, so I asked to take her to a boutique or a salon just down the road from where we work and just to have her made up, feel like a princess, take some pictures. They awarded that dream. They, and then when she called me, it was overwhelming. I didn't think it would happen. Emily had called me and told me, she's like, we decided to grant your dream. And I was still just, for a minute, I was just in complete shock. I started crying. Waterworks, just complete waterworks. I was overwhelmed. I didn't think it would happen. Not, not the dream being granted that my daughter would be able to have this birthday party that I wanted her to have so badly. My boss called me into the office and they sent me and my daughter and my sister and her boy to Disney for four days, three nights. And she went to the Bippity Boppity Boutique for the makeover that I had asked for. And then they tell, always take it a step further, and she said, and on top of this, we would like to go ahead and give her some presents, as we know times are tough. So she got a pink bike. It, it was just, it was marvelous. It was wonderful. One of my top three things that's ever happened to me. It goes for about four or five more minutes, but you see the point. We don't have an obligation to be great employers. We have an opportunity to be great employers. One of the most impactful books I ever read was Atlas Shrugged. And what I really understood from it was entrepreneurs and CEOs, just because we're profit-centric, will actually create a great company because we know that if we have a great company, no one will quit. We don't need the government to say, treat people well. We do that out of greed alone. But what if we could actually do it because we cared? What if you could go back to your company and really, truly care tomorrow about your employees? Not because of profit, not because of revenue, not because of a goal, but because you actually somehow connected with that opportunity. If you can take the idea of the management by walking around and actually go and spend time with your employees and really connect with them, that's when you can really shift the business community. That's when you can really shift what's happening in their lives. That's where your revenue and profits will shift. Don't shoot the messenger. When your employees come to you with a problem or a conflict or something that's going wrong, 
God gave us two ears and one mouth. Let's use them in that ratio. Let's listen twice as much as we talk. Think about that when they come to you, because all they want to know is that you've heard what they're saying and that you're taking it into consideration, but don't yeah about them. Rockefeller used to take time to go for a walk every day. He would literally just go for a walk. And he'd go past people and say, hey, do you want to come with me? Like, I'm not hitting on you, just want to come for a walk? I'm not hitting on you either. Just like, what are we going to talk about? Nothing, just going for a walk. And what he did with this action of going for a walk every day or having a nap every day was just to show people that they were allowed to just take time to just relax. That we didn't have to be this big, stressful ball of goals all the time, that maybe it was okay to just breathe. We had a booze ferry, and the booze ferry's job every Friday at 3 o'clock was to walk around the company with a cooler on wheels and hand out a drink to everybody while they were sitting at their desk, because we all know by 3 o'clock on Friday you don't want to be there anyway, so we may as well bring you a drink so you can get through the last couple hours of your work. Look for opportunities to celebrate everything. Celebrate every success, every goal, every random act of kindness. Does anybody out there have going away parties for employees? I don't want you to ever have another going away party. That's the one thing I don't want you to celebrate. Here's why. They're leaving. You won't get any leverage out of it. So what I want to do is figure out how much money do you normally spend on a going away party. Let's say it's 500 bucks. Bring that 500 bucks forward to day one. And on day one, when they show up at the company, have a whiteboard at the door that says, welcome to 1-800-GOT-JUNK and have balloons and streamers and have their computer set up on their desk working, have Outlook sitting, working, have their business cards sitting on their desk with their email address and their phone extension and everything actually working. And then introduce them to all the employees and give them a one-pager or a two-pager, kind of like your company Yelp and show them where the best lunch places are and the best places to get your hair done and the best spas and the free parking spots and the cool beer places and the $7 lunches that'll take them six months to figure out on their own. But now day one, you get them up to speed really quickly. And then at, just before lunch that first day, have them take 20 minutes to write down their bucket list and take 20 minutes to write down as many things that they want to do before they die because at lunch that day, they're going to read their bucket list to their team and their team is going to read out each of their bucket lists so everybody is constantly sharing their passions and joys. And at the end of the day when they go home, there will be a gift basket at the front door and in the gift basket will be a gift certificate for dinner for two to their favorite restaurant. And they can't quite figure out how you knew where their favorite restaurant was. But in the first interview, one of the questions we ask every candidate is, where's the one restaurant in town that you would want to go back to before you die? And we make a note of that in case we hire them, because that's the way we want to finish their first day, is give them a gift certificate to go to the favorite place that they would want to go to. And on the second day when they show up at work, we go, by the way, we don't have going away parties. We did that shit yesterday. <laughs> but that's how you welcome people in. But that is a choice. It's to be Google or to be Microsoft, and it's your choice of whether you want to be beige. Our role as the chief energizing officer is to stir the Kool-Aid. Our role is drop by drop by drop to build that awesome culture. Our job is to go into the organization every single day and figure out how. Thank you very much for having me over to Denver. Don't leave. We're going to take five minutes for questions. So if you've got a question for Cameron, please grab one of the mic runners and uh, fire away. So raise your hand. Got one over here. Again, kindly state your name. Yes. Hi, my name is Mariano Descalzi. I'm from Argentina, but I live here in Denver. Um, yeah, you mentioned this company that uh, 960 million that has all their employees remotely, something like that. So how do they do the, the meetings and the huddles and stuff? Okay, so I went down a rabbit hole and started that discussion. So um, three weeks ago, I was having dinner with a group of about 130 CEOs, and we had a small breakout dinner in Napa Valley, and I was sitting beside the CEO of a company that at his peak was doing $3 million in revenue with a $600,000 profit, had operations in every single state. He was an all-cash business, buying all of his products from the US government on, con on um, uh, consignment. So he was paying them back after he'd sold it all. And the day that he was arrested in 1991 for being the largest drug dealer in American history, Freeway Rick Ross was doing $960 million in revenue. My, where I was going to go, and then I'm like, I can't tell this story because it's way out of the box. And um, he actually obsessed about core values. 
he talked about how if there was an employee conflict, as much as they don't like his business, if there was an employee conflict, they all had guns. And if one gun got shot off, it would take down the company because the police would come in. So he would meet with people or have his, his team meet with people and talk about core values and what their culture was and how they needed to address it. And they would help them work through the conflict together. They would even get families involved to get them to work through that, which is like crazy lessons. But it was about being on the street and caring about people and knowing them. If one of his employees ever got arrested, he would take money down to that family to take care of the family in the neighborhood while that kid was in jail. I don't know any of my employees' families. This is a guy who really, truly understood um, a business that, anyway, it was amazing. Like I, I've got this guy on video. I was like an hour and a half beside a guy who's doing $960 million a year in cocaine. It was crazy. Well, that's something you don't hear about at Vistage every right? day. His name was Freeway Rick Ross. He was trafficking so much it was like a freeway. Other questions? All right, yeah, other questions. Do we have uh, other questions? Grab a mic runner. Raise your hand. Got we it. also had Tim Ferriss from the 4-Hour Workweek and Tucker Max and Elon Musk. They were all at the same event. Any other questions? Yeah, question back there. So yeah. let's get a mic back there. Um, I, I think to, uh, my name is Sammy. Um, to continue on, I think, with the first question, when you have a distributed slash virtual workforce, how do you see people being effective in having these stand-up meetings and management by walking around when sure. it's physically? Yeah, so if you have the distributed workforce, it's about video, so Skype video, Google Hangouts. It's about leveraging online communities like Yammer, um, like Slack, like Asana, Basecamp. It's getting some 23-year-olds to come in and tell them what you do and ask them for the tools for how to actually connect the world. As baby boomers, we don't even understand this stuff, but when they show us, it's like, whoa, it's like the angels singing, right? Like, wow, it's so cool. Um, it's by setting up goals and by, by, by dealing with the, the ideas of, of what Best Buy is doing, a results-only work environment, making sure that each person has clear goals on a monthly, weekly, and daily basis, and then getting out of their way and giving them the support. We have to let go of this whole nine to five environment. And what we want to do is, is, Fortune Magazine asked me years ago, how do you motivate employees? I said, I don't, I hire motivated people. How do you hold them accountable? I don't hold anyone accountable, I hire accountable people. I had a guy working for me one time whose 10K time was 2846. He was sixth in the US Olympic trials. This guy woke up in the morning eating goals for breakfast. You didn't have to tell him what to do. He was like knocking the cover off the ball. He didn't sit and smoke and watch reality TV. He didn't have time for that. So if you hire people based on that culture and you only hire A players and you fire the Bs and Cs, you'd be amazed at what you can pull off remotely. But it's aligning them and giving them the tools and then trying to do as much FaceTime, getting them to come in once a quarter for regional meetings or events, being out in the field with them or, or just engaging over video. All right, everyone caught that? Asana, Google Hangouts, Skype. Chatter, Yammer, those are your new tools. Uh, Cameron, thank you very much. You're going to be signing your book on the break. Yep, we'll be signing outside. If you've got any business cards you want to drop off or any um, or your order forms, I'll take those as well. One more question. Okay, one last question. One, yeah. more, one more question. So uh, uh, Netflix has this very interesting um, way of helping people off the bus. You probably heard about it. The pay for They pay extremely generous severance packages. and Yeah. And uh, in, the, in the spirit of not having going away parties, yeah. um, talk to me about your attitudes around helping people off the bus. I love it. So the idea is um, Netflix does it, um, uh, the shoe company um, Zappos does it. All of my clients have done it at least once where you offer 3000 to $5,000 to someone to quit within the first six weeks of them being there. Basically, you're saying, like, if you don't want to be here, please leave now. I'll pay you to go. The other thing we do is we give 50% bonuses to people. So if I'm recruiting someone, if they make 100 grand a year, I will pay any of my employees 50 grand if they refer someone who gets that job, but they get 10 grand a year for the next five years as long as they stay and the person they bring in stay in the company as well. All these systems work. Don't try to think about it yourself. Rip off and duplicate. Your R&D should stand for rip off and duplicate. Okay, thank you very much for Cameron. Thank you.